This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Songwriters Joe Allen, Roger Cook, and Jim Pasquale on this edition of Conversations. In October of each year, the beautiful beaches of Pensacola, Florida become the stage for some of the most prolific songwriters in the music business. On this edition of Conversations, we'll talk with three accomplished writers who have been a part of the Pensacola Beach Songwriters Festival. Joe Allen's musical resume includes being a leading Nashville session player, as well as writing, playing, and recording with names like Glenn Campbell, Merle Haggard, Julie Andrews, and Andy Williams. Joe is still active on the Nashville music scene, with a couple of his songs landing on a Yola album and upcoming releases recorded by Gene Watson and John Anderson. Roger Cook traveled across the pond to get to Music City. The prolific songwriter may be best known for his hit, I'd Like to Teach the World to Sing. But there's more. He scored hits with Crystal Gale, Don Williams, and George Strait. In the late 1990s, he became the first Englishman to be inducted into the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame. Jim Pasquale's songs have scored success both nationally and internationally. They've been recorded by an impressive array of artists, including Ray Charles, Gene Watson, Dorothy Moore, Ed Bruce, and Eric Clapton with Bobby Whitlock. These days, he's settling back a bit, but still active. He and his wife and partner, Renita, I should say, i got to make sure I get that right, are founders of the Pensacola Beach Songwriters Festival, which is why we're all here. So welcome, guys. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank Hi you there, for Dad. having us. <laughs> you yeah. bet. You bet. Yeah. How did it all, I'll ask him to throw this up kind of as a, as a jump ball type situation here. How did it happen? Where, where what, what sparked you to want to be a, a songwriter and a performer? Let's start with you, Jim. I played as a teenager, played lead guitar in a band and we recorded when we were kids and started traveling on a circuit uh, in New Orleans with guys like Dr. John who was Mac yep. Ravenack in those days, Jimmy Clanton, Frankie Ford. We did all the shows and and when little teenage girls were and we were little teenage boys but when they would turn all our pictures off the stage I went you know what I think I like this. <laughs> it's a pretty good gig. It's better than high school. <laughs> That's right. Now now what about you Roger? You you were in England and, and ended up coming to the States. How did it begin for you? Well uh, I came from a musical family. I joined the doo-wop group purely vocals. That's why I never picked up a guitar. And uh, in 1958, we uh, won a few talent contests on TV and that, and we went on the road. And while we were on the road, the guitarist wrote a song for the girl singer to sing, and I was so jealous, I thought, if he can write a song, I can write a song. <laughs> so I sat down and wrote a song, it was, took me 10 minutes, you know, and I thought, I could do this. Yeah, yeah. And that was my birth as a songwriter. I, I, I'm curious why you, why do you use the ukulele as opposed to, to a guitar? I was doing a show in 1963 in England and a, another singer on the, in, on the show said to me, um, do you want to buy a ukulele? I said, I don't know how to play one. He said, I'll teach you three chords. And he did and I thought, well, that's, I said, how much do you want for? He said, six quid. So I said, you're done. And so I've had a ukulele in my hand since 1963. Wow, wow. How about you, Joe? How did it all begin? Well, uh, I was born in Waco, south of Waco, Texas, and I started playing the guitar. My mother started teaching me when I was about eight years old. Okay. When I was 11 years old, I started playing uh, out with my dad, who played fiddle. We played hoedowns and Bob Wells type music. Right. And uh, I learned how to play the guitar. And when I was 15 years old, uh, a fellow came and I joined the union and became a, uh, with a band I, and I played six nights a week. And uh, from there I just progressed and I met uh, a lot of people and I progressed up through the music thing and became a jazz bass player. And I was uh, in Aspen, Colorado when the call came for me to come and write songs in Nashville. And so that's how I got to Nashville, and uh, and I I loved what I was doing, and I still do. And, and you were you were quite well known as a session player in in. I, pl I played thousands of sessions, yeah. and uh, and I uh, and I and I I played in Nashville and wrote for about eighteen years, yeah. and uh, I started hitting a brick wall, and I 
So I told my wife, I said, we've got to start cutting my book because I just can't do three and four sessions a day and write 50 songs a year. I can't, right, right. can't hold up. And uh, so uh, I left for quite a while. And uh, then I started writing again. And, uh, and I'm glad I did because it's really what I love to do. It's really, really what I started off to do in Nashville. Yeah. And now I'm getting to do that. What makes a great songwriter? A great song. <laughs> Can't argue with that. <laughs> yeah. Is it? I, I mean, I, I guess, and, I, and I've interviewed a lot of songwriters over the years, and, and, and I'm always curious about this. Is it something that you just feel like it's just is in you, or or is it or is it a mechanical thing? I mean, is it yeah. is it a? They come in all sorts of ways. It's, I always say it's a gift of God, I, yeah. I, and and it just. It either comes in the form of a melody, uh -huh. and then all of a sudden lyrics will come with it, or it's lyrics and you put the melody with it. Or if you get stumped, you go call a friend and say, look, what do you think? And that's how Joe and I ended up writing uh -huh. several records together was that uh -huh. very same reason. Good right. Yeah. Well, you guys wrote a big one for Gene Watson, right? We did. We wrote one that uh, called Bottle of Tears. Uh -huh. It went... Uh, it, it hit the charts at 72 in the Billboard Cashboard charts, and it had a, a bullet. It was uh, pick hit of the week. Uh -huh. uh, it got a great write-up, and it was headed for number one. And I don't know, some political thing happens. We don't know what. Right, right. But all of a sudden, it went from 50 to uh, back to 100, Oblivion. like an anchor on a chain <laughs> out of a ship. Uh -huh. Are you guys in a position to do a couple of minutes of it? You want to do, you want to do a couple of minutes of it? A bottle of sure. tears? Yeah. Do you want me oh, to a bottle do of tears? To Go ahead, man. Tricks. I pull some good ones in my time. I played them with the best of mine. Go ahead, Joe. Fill my pockets full of silver and gold. Walk down on love when love left me cold. I'm a man in a bottle, a bottle of tears. Caught up in a heartache, drowning in fear. I'm a man in a bottle of tears. I battled my way to the top. And I bottled my way to the bottom. I hope I didn't mess you up too bad. <laughs> it's been a long time since we played that. Sounds a lot like country to me. Uh, hey, the good thing country. was you didn't mess us up when we were right. Yeah. Oh, I know it. Yeah, that's we, right, uh, that's right. I didn't mean to put you all on the spot like oh, that. Oh, that's but, all right. I, well, neither one of us has done it for years. Uh, no. So. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I think back to the era, you know, music, the music industry's changed so much over the years and just the way songs are, you know, produced th these days. And, and we were talking in the green room and I, I did not realize that you wrote Barbara Mandrell's first hit, Number right? One, yeah. Midnight and Oil. nominated yeah. and the whole That's nine right. yards. And I, I, in fact, I escorted uh, the, her two sisters, uh, Louise, Louise and, Erling. and Erling, to the to the Grammys. Oh, okay. And uh, that was kind of nice having I bet. those two dolls on my arm. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. You I'm know? sure. And uh, anyway, we didn't win, but they all said, "Well, she's really young, and she's won plenty since." Oh so, yeah. I mean, what an know, amazing career I'm she very had. Very proud of that. Yeah. yeah. And you know. Music has changed so much. We used to write really gutsy songs. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Country songs were about cheating. They were about drinking. They were about all yeah, kinds right. of stuff. Right. And now it's gone to maybe a little lighter level. Right. Right. And uh, which I'm kind of glad. Right. Uh, 
I'm not. <laughs> I'm not, because I can't get in any <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it Speak depends, I guess, yourself. on the way you yeah. look at it. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to do a little bit of that song, Midnight Oil, though. But that goes back for a few years, but it was Barbara Mandrell's first big hit, right? It, it was her first number one, and, and Billy Sherrill, I, I actually wrote it as a male song. Okay. I, I didn't write it for a girl. Okay. I wrote it with putting on my coat and tie. Okay. And Billy Sherrill, the great producer, called me and said, Joey said, I got this pretty young lady that I that wants to record that, but we want to change the, the tagline to putting on my makeup. And I said, sounds good to me, Billy, Go because Billy it. Sherrill, you didn't turn Billy down. Yeah, he's you? a big deal. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. it, and it didn't cost me nothing. Back now, now it would cost you a ton. You know, <laughs> right, you right, know right. what I mean? But yeah, Billy and, and Barbara were still, uh, well, uh, Barbara and I are still friends. Uh, we talk every now and then on Great. the phone. Awesome. And uh, she's an awesome lady. And, yeah. and um uh, and she had a wonderful TV show and a great career. She had an awesome TV you know, show. Awesome yeah. career. Yeah, and, yeah. and I was so proud of her. I mean, you know, uh, it's almost like, uh, I don't know, I thought I had something to do with it. Yeah. You know, and I've wrote several people's first chart records. So you're proud of those. You Absolutely. Know, even if they don't go to number one, you're proud of Absolutely. them. Absolutely. You know, yeah, to break know. them into the business. You How'd know. that song go? I forgot Oh, that. The Midnight Oil? Yeah, I forgot That call was from the office. That's it. And I yeah, guess man. I'll have to burn the midnight oil again. And you know how much the boss depends on me to lend a helping hand. And I watch her in the mirror as I lie and tell her I don't know how late I'll be. Well, I'm putting on my cowboy hat, putting on the one that really loves me. And tonight I'll cheat again. And tomorrow I'll be sorry. I'll feel kind of dirty, cause I'll have the midnight all, all over me. God knows she'd bring it turn if she knew the little had me and won't set me free a long time ago. <laughs> While I'm putting on my makeup, that's Barbara, putting on the one that really loves me. That's awesome. While I'm putting on my makeup, putting on the one that really loves me. That's great, Jerry. That is great. Yeah. Yeah. That's a long time ago, man. Yeah, that's I real country music. That was, that was country back when yeah. it was country wasn't cool. Uh, that's, <laughs> yeah. right, that's, yeah. right, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Roger, tell me, you you wrote a big hit for for Don Williams. T tell me about that. Yeah. Well, I first came to town in '75. In fact, I was doing a session for Warner Brothers. I was recording an album. And Joe happened to be the bass player on there. Okay, okay. Uh, a bunch of wonderful musicians, Reggie Young, Bobby Wood, and Kenny Malone, Charles Kaufman. Right. Anyway, um, at that time, Don Williams was really hot. Yep. He was just sounding like crazy. And I thought, I loved his voice, and I thought, if I could ever get a song with Don Williams, wouldn't that be something? Right. I would have arrived in town, you right, know? Right, right, right. Because I made up my mind I was going to live in Nashville. Anyway, I eventually got some songs with Don. I, I was friends with his producer, Garth Fundus. And one day Garth came to my office and I played them a demo of a brand new song, I Believe in You. Yeah. And halfway through the demo, Garth said, look at that, and the hairs on his arm were standing up. He said, I think Don would have a big hit with that song. He said, he might want to change a word here and there, because yeah. I had yeah. some words in there. He wouldn't say damn. Well, I got the word damn in the song. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, he, Don ended up cutting the song. We had a, a nice big hit with it, oh. and uh, it brought me into town in a nice way, you know. Do a little bit of it for I'll us. I'll do a little bit. I don't believe in superstars, organic food and foreign cars. 
I don't believe the price of gold, the certainty of growing old, that right is right and left is wrong. North and south can get along, that east is east and west is west. And being first is always best, but I believe in love. I believe in babies. I believe in mom and dad. And I believe in you. Yeah, and yeah, some yeah. more. Uh, That's good stuff, huh? Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you. I should say, actually, I had the lyric written. I thought I had the song written completely. And I went to my office one night and I played it to a friend of mine. His name was Sammy Hogan. Sam is up in heaven now. He that anyway, um, Sammy said to me, he said there's some lines in there. He said, uh, I don't think anybody in t this town are going to sing. I said, oh, really? I said, like, which ones? And he pointed out three or four lines. And uh, I said, well, help me with it, man. Come on, help me with it. So we sat down over the space of about two hours. We straightened the lyric out to where anybody could cut the song, you know. Right, right. So thank you, Sammy, for that. I think it's kind of interesting. You said if I could just get Don Williams to cut my song, and I'm always curious. You ever, you ever see an artist or hear an artist and go, I, I can write a song that'll work really well for them, or do you just write songs and hopes? I never have. Personally. No, no, I just write for myself. Yeah, yeah. I hope that somebody will like it. it. Hopes that somebody likes it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 interesting. Do you, are, are you genre specific, specific? I mean, you say, I'm, I'm writing a country song, or, or do you just, you just try to find good lyrics and, and, and see where it goes, I guess. Melodies to me, mainly. I, I, I love melodies. If the melody is right, then the lyrics seem to just flow. Yeah, yeah. It I helps to have what I call the public hear, where you actually hear in your head what you know the public will like. Right. You just know how to hook a song. Right. M but melodically and lyrically, you know, and that's, uh, you're gifted if you've got that in you, you know. Why did you wait 40 years to say that? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, just, learned, I, just, I, learned, so, I just learned something. <laughs> Tell us, old master. <laughs> he, this gentleman here was my first publisher. Is that right? Yeah. That right? You yeah. guys go back a long ways, all yeah, of you. Yeah, huh? over 40 some odd years. Yeah. Uh, 45 uh, years, yeah. just about. Yeah. 45 yeah. years, Roger and I. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I, I worked. I was actually Don Williams' leader in the sessions, uh -huh. and uh, he asked me to put the band together, and I basically put a lot of the Joe band together. Joe played bass on "I Believe in You." Oh, yeah, okay. oh yeah. yeah. I, we had twenty-eight number ones in a row. Wow. When you're in a session like that, and you, and you're doing an album or you're doing a song, do you get a feeling this thing's going to be a hit? Oh yeah. Do you know when you write? Oh yeah. Yeah, you you know you know when you're playing, uh, you know when you when you've got lightning in a bottle, you know it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and it's like that it's like that magic thing that happens, yeah. and I'll tell you, I have to admit that uh, back then we played the whole thing. In other words, there wasn't any punching in. There wasn't any no uh, computers, uh, right. no computers, right. nothing. Right. We we recorded analog, and so. To be a session player was, I had a blast for a long time doing it, but it is a pressure cooker. But when they started coming out with digital and Kenny Malone and I just refused to play with the click track for a long time because we just didn't need it. Music to us should flow, right. you know. Right. And uh, so the new technologies, you really don't have to be that good to play now and to make records and all that. I, I was going to ask you that, you know, are today's singer, are, are yesteryear's singers better than today's singers? I think so personally. No I question. Think so, but no maybe question. you would disagree yeah. with that, you know. When you listen to those old singers like uh, Ella Fitzgerald say, right. Right. Oh, listen yeah. to her early recordings in the early 40s and that, they were going straight down to mono. Right. And her intonation is Perfect. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And they would run it two or three times, and then she had to get it right, and the band had to get it right. That's and then you went upstairs and you heard the record. There was nothing else to do. That's right. right. They cut straight to vinyl back then. Yeah. Yeah. And when I started recording back in 62, I did a session in, in Hollywood with Leon McAuliffe. I was playing Western Swing with him, which okay. I knew how to play. And uh, 
He was Bob Wells, still guitar player. But uh, uh, they they cut direct to vinyl. And uh, you remember, they yeah. went right to vinyl Tony. and they mastered off of that. So everything you played was on there. There was no cutting anything out. There was no doing this or doing that. Wow. It was, uh, so it was a whole different thing. Remember Cowboy built the studio where he had the room for the strings and the whole thing, oh, had yeah. the thing out in the middle. Yeah. And then we started uh, liking it to where we all get in a circle in place so we had eye contact. Yeah. Yeah. And that was an important thing. Magic. It was, magic. It was magic. Was. And, you know. Uh, well, we cut in Chicago when we were youngsters at uh, Chess Records. And they had us all in one place playing at the same time. And uh, the reason I'm saying this is it's probably I'm going to ask forgiveness for those who have gone before me uh, and who are probably in line like myself. Uh, we ended up cutting a song 15 times the same song, and it was my Stratocaster that was pulling out every time. So uh, everything was live, yeah. and they were trying to figure out what in the world is wrong. <laughs> Each person had to play an individually, but when I played the thing, I pulled on the neck, and it pulled the guitar out. The strats were real bad about that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, it was great and good times. and. Weird time. You know, it, that old analog sound to me has such a warmth to it that it I don't does. think you have oh, in the digital exactly. era. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Yeah. It had yeah. a, a evenness about it. Yeah. To me, digital digital recordings actually, to Kenny Malone and I anyway, feel like. Yeah. 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 It's sterile. Yeah. It's real sterile. And, I've, you know, I mean, vocals are tuned now. They're tuned. They cut and paste. They say, well, you sang that one line great towards the end. You know, we'll move that up to the front. Right. And I mean, it's are just not the same. To, are you going to put all this into your show? Because there's people out there that's probably going to get mad at us for what we're saying. <laughs> no, <laughs> no it's, I'm sure, it's all in I'm the sure show. I'm sure they might, you know. <laughs> uh -oh. No, 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 no. But, but, you know, you, you think about it, and even the youngsters today, I mean, they're going back and they're buying, I mean, they're going and buying albums. They're going and buying vinyl. Right. Absolutely. Right. 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 So, so it's not like the, the young generation doesn't understand that. They're yeah. cutting on two inch, too, yeah. and that's, uh, that's uh, the tape. Interesting. Let yeah. me. Uh, yeah. I, I, I want to. I want to talk to Roger about this because we're getting short on time, and we're going to have him do this song when it when we when we fade out of the program here. But tell me, you know, it was a, a big song for the Coca-Cola advertising campaign. Wish I could teach the world to to see. Tell me about how did that come about, and and, and how did Coke get involved? Well, Coca-Cola decided they needed something anthemic. It was the days of brotherhood of man, we must all love each other, you know. Right. This is 1970, 71. And uh, we had a song, Roger and I, it had gone out as a record, and it was a, it was a pretty tune, but a dog of a lyric. It was real bad. And it flopped, you know. And I'm glad it flopped. <laughs> anyway, the, the guys, um, the two guys who, who came up with the idea of, um, it's a real thing, you know, the jingle right, part right. of it. They came to England and they said, have you got any tunes? Because we've been writing a lot of Coke commercials. They said, have you got a tune that would suit like an anthemic thing, you know, where everybody can kind of, you know, be happy together. We played them this tune and they said, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, that'll work. And little Greenaway came up with the line, I'd like to teach the world to sing. And I came up with imperfect harmony <laughs> and the song took off. Wow. And it became a radio jingle. We wrote 60 seconds. It was a 60 second jingle. Yeah. And uh, it went out as a radio jingle. It didn't do much at all. But just a couple of years later, they decided they were going to do a big video in Rome. No, in England first and get all the kids from the embassies, you know. And uh, it rained. It rained for three days. So they couldn't film it. They went to Rome and it rained for the whole first two days, I think. <laughs> But they got the kids on the hill in the end, and uh, well, the thing just took off. Yeah. They had people calling in, you know, the Coca Cola saying, Where can we get the sheet music or a <laughs> copy of a record? There was no record. Yeah. So we finished the song up, you know, and uh, it got recorded, and well, the rest is uh, history. 
The rest I spent already. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have you do the song as we close the program out. And I've got about two minutes. And, Jim, I want to address real quick you and your wife, Renita, responsible for the Pensacola Beach Songwriters Festival, seems to be getting better and better each year. Give me just kind of about a one-minute spiel on the, on, the, on the festival. On the festival itself? Yes. Well, I cannot take credit personally. It's all with my wife. She had previously done other festivals, mm -hmm. you know. And she used to book me down to the festival, and I always say, she booked me, then she hooked me, so that's how come she is now my wife. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a business background, right, right? and she wanted something to do after she left the festival, and I said, I got a few dollars. If you're brave enough, let's do this thing. So we went to Pensacola Beach. Renee Mack, who runs uh, the uh, Paradise. Paradise, Paradise. Bon thank you so much. I can even think about it. Suggested about a songwriter festival. Renee said, what did you think? And of course, I had had uh, a bushwhacker, and I said, that's a wonderful idea. And they said, well, we got our first writer. Let's go. <laughs> that was 11 years ago. Wow. It just... And it's been a very successful, yeah. wonderful, and I thank the good Lord above. Yeah, yeah. And my friends. Yeah coming down. It, and you know what's really neat about it too is I mean it, there's folks like yourselves who are accomplished and experienced and hit records to your name but there's also the young up-and-comers and, and the opportunity so it's a real it's a real treat. Thank you guys. This has been a lot of fun. I mean, we could, we could go on all night and talk about it. Yeah, <laughs> tell, tell some great stories and all. So you and, and, and you all are still, I know you're kind of laying back a little bit and doing some stuff with the festival. You're still actively writing? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I know you're actively writing and still working some in, in Music City, huh? Uh, yeah. Great. And, and also, I've been doing a lot of work down here at Sandy Roots Productions right. over in, in uh, Perdido Key. Awesome. Awesome. We got some good things happening over there. Yeah, it's, it's it's amazing how much of a musical influence is starting to to uh, uh, kind of sink into South. the Gulf Coast there here. Are you all bet. Kinds yeah. of writers and musicians that have moved down here. Oh yeah. Just to perform. Oh yeah. It's it's good yeah, stuff. Guys, me. I got to run. We got exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> loved it. Loved it. Hang on one second. I'm going to get you to do that, Roger. But I want to tell everybody you can see more of our conversations with songwriters and all kinds of interesting personalities online at wsre.org slash conversations and also on YouTube. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the broadcast. You guys take great care of yourself. And we're going to have Roger take us home with I wish I could teach the world to sing. Take it away, my friend. I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I'd like to hold it in my arms and keep it company. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honey bees in snow white turtle doves. It's a real thing. Cow kiss in the back of your mind. Coca Cola, watch your head, open the fire. Oh, yeah, it's the real thing. I want a free bottle of Coke for that. Thank you, guys. <laughs>